going to continue the series tonight, um, Death to Self, and we're going to look at this, Let's Make a Deal. Now, how many of you guys have ever made a bad deal? Anybody want to share their worst deal? Christy? You traded what? A snivy. What's a snivy? Oh, and you traded for a bad Pokemon? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right, anybody else? What's your worst trade? You made a deal with somebody and you got like the bad end of the deal. They banned Pokemon because of you? Okay. Anybody trade something besides Pokemon? <laughs> Ethan, what was your worst deal? You paid five bucks for a bad Nintendo game. All right. Anybody else? <laughs> you know, you think about what makes a bad deal. Someone says, hey, let's make a deal. They got a Pokemon you're going to trade. They got a game you want to trade. Something like that. What? What makes it feel like a bad deal is when you feel like they got something better than you or they got something more than you, right? Yeah, that's what generally makes a bad deal. Last week we talked about two guys. Anybody remember their names? Jacob and Esau. What I call them last week. Jake the Snake and Red is who I call them, right? Now, these two guys, they, they make a deal, and we're going to look at the deal that they make tonight. So, anybody have their Bibles? Grace has a Bible. Beto has a Bible. Bible prizes. Is there any prizes left from the game? Absolutely. All right, Jenny, you want to hook these two up with some Bible prizes? Because I have to go to the store this week and get some more. <laughs> I'm out of cookies. All right, Grace and Beto had Bibles. If you bring Bibles, I, and last time I had Grandma's Cookie 2 Pack. So if you bring your Bible, you get a prize like that. So I have to go to the store. I just ran out last week of the cookies. So make sure to bring your Bible, and I will reward you. If you have your Bible, Genesis chapter 25, verse 29, shows us these two guys, Jacob and Esau, or Jake the Snake and Red. They make a deal, and Red comes out with a short end of the stick. And the first thing I want you to see in this story is this, the effects of failure and fatigue, okay? The effects of failure and fatigue. Look at this story. Now, Jacob cooked some stew, and when Esau came in from the open fields, he was famished. So Esau said to Jacob, feed me some of the red stuff. Yeah, this red stuff, because I'm starving. This is why he was also called Edom. Anybody have something you cook at your house, and it's called one name, but you call it something else? Like, we have this soup that we like to make, and it's got all this different stuff in it, but we just call it cheese block soup, because you take a block of cheese and put it in. That's what we call it. It doesn't sound very appetizing, but it's delicious. Anybody else have something like that? Well, Jake the snake here was at home cooking, and he made some stew, and his brother, is, is, uh, he just comes in and says, give me some of that red stuff. So last week, we learned that these two guys have very different personalities, right? Like, I'm sure if you have a brother or a sister, you're very different, right? Yes. Well, Jacob was, he preferred to stay home, close to the tents. He was a little bit of a mama's boy, right? Esau, he was a man's man. He was hairy. He liked to hunt. He was good at hunting. He liked to bring home uh, what he caught, what he, what he shot, whatever he, he killed. And so he liked to bring home something from hunting. And here we see that Esau goes out hunting. Was he successful in his hunt? How do we know that? Because he was hungry. He didn't have anything to bring home and kill and eat, right? So he's not only hungry and tired, but he's also unsuccessful in his hunting trip. Anybody, sometimes you get hungry and you get a little bit crabby. I love this commercial. This is, this is, this is sometimes how I am when I'm a little bit hungry. Marsha, what happened? Peter hit me on the nose with a football. I can't go to the dance like this. Well, I'm sure it was an accident, sweetheart. An eye for an eye. That's what Dad always says. I never said that, honey. Shut up! God, teach Peter a lesson. Marsha, eat a Snickers. Why? You get a little hostile when you're hungry. Better? Better. Marsha! 
Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Jan, this isn't about you. It never is. Anybody else like that? You get a little hungry, you get a little crabby, you're like Danny Trejo putting an ax on the table. You know, um, how many of you guys have ever done something stupid because you were tired and hungry? Yeah? How many, I've, I've, I don't know how many times I've been tired, I've been hungry, I go to the fridge, and stuff's like kind of, you guys have the leftover stack that's like a Tetris puzzle, put it back into the fridge. And what you want is the very back of the fridge. You're so tired, you're so hungry, you just immediately go for it. And in the meantime, when you pull it out, you knock something else over. So then whatever you knock over spills all over the front of the fridge, inside the fridge, all over the floor. Anybody else done that? Yeah, that's what happens when you're tired and you're hungry and you do stupid stuff. Well, this is what happens when failure and fatigue meet. Let me just give you guys a warning. In your life, be careful when you realize you're tired and you feel like a failure because you will do stupid things when those two things combine. When you feel like you failed, now, now Esau is the hunter. He's known as the hunter. He's a manly man. His name Esau comes from how hairy and red he was, like an orangutan. And dude, this guy, he's known just to go out, find something, kill it, drag it home, skin it, and eat it. And his identity is wrapped up in what he does. And so when he has failed at that, he feels like he's not himself, and he's about to do something really stupid. Failure and fatigue have horrible consequences when you aren't aware that they're happening. Because this is what happens. When failure and fatigue combine, the number two on your fill-in is this. Unsatisfied appetites become exaggerated emotions. It's kind of like the Snickers commercial we just watched. You know, she got hit in the nose and, and, and the guy she's being is all mad and he's like, eye for an eye. That's what I always say. He puts the ax on the table, right? Now, somebody hitting you in the nose is no reason to go cut their face off, right? That's, that's, doesn't, that doesn't even make sense. Nope. It doesn't even make sense. Nope. That level of get back is not even where it's at. Look at what the Bible says in Genesis 25, 31 and 32. It says, but Jacob replied, First, sell me your birthright. Verse 32, look, said Esau, I'm about to die. What use is the birthright to me? Now, he probably was not on death's door. No, he wasn't like Survivor Man who's been out, dropped off on a deserted island for like two weeks with nothing to eat but a couple of little snails and cockroaches that he caught, right? He wasn't that famished. He wasn't about to die. But see, his failure and his fatigue lined up and it made his appetite push his emotions out of bounds, right? You see, when you get too hungry, everything gets blown out of proportion. I think that should be on your feeling too, yeah. When you get too hungry, everything gets blown out of proportion. And I'm not just talking about being hungry because you skipped lunch, because you didn't like what was available. I'm not talking about hungry because maybe you didn't eat dinner before you showed up tonight and you, the last thing you ate was lunch and it's way past dinner time so your belly's starting to grumble. I'm talking about appetites that you have in your life. Every one of us has a different appetite, not just for food, but for things like wanting to be accepted, right? Every one of us wants to be accepted by people that we're surrounded with. Every one of us want to be included. If there's an activity, if there's a game, if there's something going on, you want to be a part of it. You have an appetite to be accepted. You have an appetite to be included. Every one of us has an appetite to be loved and noticed by somebody, right? That appetite is in you. And here's the thing. God will fulfill all of those appetites that you have in your life if you'll let him. But sometimes we don't want to be patient enough to let him do that, so we try and let other people fill those appetites. And when you're unsatisfied in your appetite, when, you've, when you're exhausted and you've failed, these emotions get all out of balance, and you start saying things like this, nobody likes me. Now, is that true? Nobody likes you? No, that's, that's never true. Somebody likes you. Or you say, you know what? Everybody went to go see the movie. Nobody ever invites me to go anywhere. Is that true? No, I'm going to invite everyone right here. If you can, we're going to go find some ice cream or something after church tonight. So everyone's invited. And you can never say nobody invited me because the pastor here just invited you right now. I don't well, find Well, we'll find a way to make it happen or something. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying you're invited. I'm not saying you're provided. I'm saying you're invited. 
So you can't ever say that. I, you could sit here and say, I bet nobody here even knows my name. My name's Sam. Anybody know Justinia's brother's names? Uh, uh, that's Sam. That's, nope. Uh, Camille. So why don't you tell everyone what you prefer? Jose, yes. He had, you had, you had, there's two there. Jose and Angel. Welcome, guys. Good to have you here tonight. Give him a hand. Right, so now you can't say nobody here knows your name because we all know your name now. It's just a matter of getting everyone else's name in. But you see, when you feel like a failure and you're tired and you let your emotions all get out of balance because your appetites are unfulfilled, you, you begin to say these crazy things like nobody likes me, nobody knows me, nobody ever wants me to go anywhere, nobody appreciates me, nobody loves me, right? And those statements aren't true. You see, Jacob realizes this truth. Like, the, that's a human truth. Unsatisfied appetites become exaggerated. So, He's the mama's boy, but right here he becomes the hunter because he sees an opportunity to take advantage of his brother. He he realizes his brother is coming home. He's failed at the hunt. He's not brought anything home to cook. He's tired. He's hungry. His appetite is unfulfilled, and so his emotions are all out of balance. And so Esau, the great and mighty hunter, becomes the hunted by Jacob, the mama's boy, you see, Jacob, we talked about him being a deceiver. He's a heel grabber. He sees an opportunity to take advantage of his older brother, and he does it. Now, here's what you got to do. You have to watch out because people like this are all around you. There are people in your life that want to take advantage of your unsatisfied appetite. They see in you that, oh, they only want people to like them. They only want people to know their name. They only want this or they only want that. And so they promise to kind of dangle it in front of you. You know, like it's, it's the girl that wants to be your friend, but when she has a sleepover, she doesn't want you to come because you're maybe not cool enough to be around her other friends. Girls are just, man, that makes me so mad about girls. The girls, guys don't really do that. Guys are like, hey, you want to sleep over? And the moms are like, I don't want them at my house because they smell like a locker room. But the guys are like, who cares? We're going to wrestle all night and eat food until we puke, right? And play video games till we can't keep our eyes open. That's a boy sleepover. Girls are like talking about each other and doing their nails. And I don't know. It's, that's kind of how it rolls. But you have to watch out because girls, you need to watch out for boys that want to use you and then drop you, Right? Girls, girls, you need to watch out because you're too valuable to become somebody's emotional toy, right? Guys, you need to watch out for somebody that, that just wants to, they, they like you because you have something that they don't have, like a video game, and they just want to use you to come over to your house to play your video game, but then don't want anything else to do with you. That's not really a friend. That's not somebody that you need to be around. These people are fair weather friends. They want to be with you when everything's going good. But if something goes bad in your life, they're not going to be there to support you. They're going to take advantage of you. See, these people aren't worth you being in their life because they're the kind that are going to talk about you behind your back. Right? See, Jacob here sees an unfulfilled appetite in his brother and he sees an opportunity to take advantage of him. He says, he says, you know what? Before I feed you, I've got some of this yummy red stuff. But before you can have any, sell me your birthright. And his brother gives in. As we look back at the story, the oldest brother is entitled to the birthright. Now, the birthright is this. It's a double portion of the inheritance. So that means if, uh, if when their dad dies, Jacob gets 500 bars of gold, the birthright says that Esau, Esau gets a thousand. And it's not just that double inheritance of the money, but it's also the privilege of being seen as the next spiritual leader of the family. And so that's what the birthright is. It was something that was supposed to be honored. It was significant. It was something that was supposed to be protected. But in this moment, because he's tired, he's hungry, he's mad about his failed, fun, his failed hunt, and his appetite's all out of whack. His emotions are blowing out of the water. He's willing to sell all of that for one meal, one bowl of stew. What you have to realize is Jesus is the only one that can satisfy the deepest desires of your life. Anything else will leave you empty and it'll make you make stupid deals like Esau did. See, he, he was impulsive. Anybody know what that means? What's it mean to be impulsive? 
It means this, to decide to do something without thinking through the consequences. Every one of you has probably been impulsive once or twice in your life. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess. You've made some impulsive decisions. Impulsive decisions are often made because we want instant gratification. Now, here's instant gratification says that anybody like those frozen pot pies? The like Stouffer's or whatever, you know, you put them in the freezer. Now, those pot pies are good if you put them in the oven and let them cook for 30 minutes, Right? But how many of you guys want to wait 30 minutes for that pot pie to be done? Now, how many would prefer to take that pot pie and throw it in the microwave for five minutes, and then it'll be done, and you can eat it immediately, right? That's instant gratification. We want it now, even though it'll be better if we wait. We don't care about the better. We just want that thing right now. And you see, that's what Esau failed to realize his birthright was better. Having a double portion of the inheritance and being the spiritual leader of the family was worth waiting for. But instead he said, no, I'm hungry right now. I want the soup right now. You can have whatever you want. You see how unsatisfied appetites make emotions get exaggerated. You see, impulsive decisions cause you to do this. Number three, give up what you want most for what you see now. When you're impulsive, when you feel like a failure and you're tired and you let your, um, you let your uh, unsatisfied appetites exaggerate your emotions, then you become willing to give up what you want most for what you see now. Verses 33 and 34 say this, but Jacob said, swear an oath to me now. So Esau swore an oath to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and lentil stew. Esau ate and drank, then got up and went out. So Esau despised his birthright. See, here's what's amazing to me. When you read that, it's like he just slurps it down and walks away. He doesn't even give any indication that he really liked this lentil soup, which is like beans. That's all it is. He, he said, I'm going to give up half of my inheritance and the right to spiritually lead our family, be the leader of our, the next generation leader, I'm going I'm to sell all that for this food that probably wasn't even that great, right? Now, it would have been different if he pulled up this full, you know, meat locker full of smoked, delicious meat that was fresh and, and yummy and had all the barbecue sauce all over it and all the sides, barbecue baked beans and, and cheesy potatoes and, and yummy garlic bread and all you could eat fountain, all you could drink fountain drinks. You know, he rolled out this big buffet. You're thinking, ooh, that might be worth trading because I could eat on that for a while. But he had one measly bowl of beans and got up. And the Bible says that he despised his, his birthright. He, Esau felt that the instant gratification of this little bit of red stew was better than the future prestige of, make, of leading his family and having that blessing. You see, this is a trick that the devil tries to use on us all the time. You have, to, you have to know that this is what the devil wants to do to you every day. He wants to make this bowl look better in the moment than it really is. And sometimes these bowls um, could show up as temporary things. You know, like... They, they're things that will forfeit your future, your purity, or your integrity. The enemy says, let's, let's make a deal. I'm going to give you this bowl. You're going to give me your birthright. And that bowl might be this. You know, a birthright of us, if you're a Christian, if you're a, a follower of Christ, you've committed your life to Jesus, and he says, I'm going to give you peace, right? So here's your birthright. It's peace. But the devil comes in and says, here's the bowl. How much fun is it just to complain about everybody all the time and just be a complainer? It's just so easy. You can just pick apart everything and complain about it. See, the, the birthright of a Christian is, is, is joy. And, and the devil comes and says, you know what? You, you just need to worry about some stuff and be anxious and have all this. And this is the bowl. It's called anxiety. But Jesus says, no, I've given you a birthright of joy. But you, you trade it and get all bent out of shape about stuff. You see, you have a birthright as a Christian of having a testimony of one that is, is marked by Jesus and you're free from anything, any sin, any desires that aren't right. And the enemy devil comes in and says, here's a bowl. Just do what feels good. 
You know what? You're mad. Let them know how mad you really are. Let your temper fly. Get noticed from these things. You see, he wants to trade something that's cheap and worthless for something that's invaluable. That's why in 2 Corinthians 4.18, Paul said this, because we are not looking at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what is seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. You see, it takes us switching our mind and saying, you know what, eternity, what is eternal has more value than what I can see right now. You know, you think about what's tempting you right now. When you go home, it's summer, you got free time, you're not in school. When you're just around the house, when you're with your friends, when you're, you're doing whatever you do in the summer, what's most tempting that you know you're not supposed to do? I'm not asking you to just tell me all your temptations right now, but you think about what is that thing that always comes that I'm like, if my parents knew about this, if, if I did this and they found out, man, I would be dead. You see, that's a cheap bowl that the, that the devil is trying to put in front of you to say, the temporary pleasure of this thing is better than the eternal reward of living a life that honors God. He tries to trick us all the time. As a Christian, you have an awesome birthright in Christ. You have an awesome birthright in Christ, so don't trade it for a cheap bowl of beans. You see, Paul talks about just one part of our birthright. Listen to what he says. As a Christian, when you live your life for Christ, this is what you get, Romans 8, 37 and 39. No, in all these things, we have complete victory through him who loved us. He's talking about Jesus. Verse 38, for I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor heavenly rulers nor things that are present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of Christ, the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Isn't that pretty awesome? You think nothing can separate me from the love of Christ. There's no angel or demon that can pull me away from the love of Jesus. I have complete victory in everything in my life because of the love of God in me. See, in Christ, you're entitled to victory, to protection from evil, and a love of God that never lets go. But the enemy wants you to say that this little bowl of beans, this temptation, this weakness, this thing that he's going to try and get at you is better than all of that. When in actuality, giving into that, that moment, it makes you feel separated from God, right? And that's not our birthright. Don't give up an awesome birthright for something that seems to satisfy in a moment because Jesus paid the ultimate price for us to be able to have this awesome birthright. And he's not asking us to sell it for a cheap bowl of beans. So what, what do you do? How can you... Live your life not giving in to the trick that Esau fell for. Well, realize when you're tired and when you failed that you're probably going to be a little more susceptible and be aware that the enemy is going to try and trip you up, right? So when you feel tired, what do you do? Rest. When you feel like you're a failure, you have to say, you know what? I'm not a failure because I have victory in Christ. That's what the Bible says in Romans 8, 37, right? When you, when, you, when you start to feel like your emotions are all exaggerated, you've got to go back and say, what unsatisfied appetite is making me to have my emotions all blown out of proportion? And say, God, I need you to fulfill this unsatisfied appetite in my life. The third thing you've got to do is realize that what you see right now that's temporary doesn't match to what God has in eternity. So I can, I can endure not having something right here and right now because God has a greater gratification and eternity for me. Let's pray tonight. Father, I thank you for the word. God, I thank you that uh, you've brought this to our attention. I pray that you would help us tonight, right now, to make a commitment, Lord, not to give in to the temporary, the, 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 the temptations that the, that the devil tries to put in front of us, that are really just cheap bowls of beans. Lord, when we can find satisfaction in you, I pray that you would help us tonight to give it all to you. Lord, change our, our mindset. Change our, what we see as valuable from the temporary things to the eternal things. Lord, I pray that the truth of your word, that nothing can separate us 
from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I pray that we would claim this awesome birthright that you've given us. In Jesus' name I pray.